mice. Uh, we actually in the U.S. pronounce it as mies, but it's actually mice in German. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about community. What is it good for? We're going to talk, uh, deal a little bit around uh, you know communities and, and how they're formed and and such. So. Um, about me, I am the head of community at Auth0. We're an identity access management uh, uh, provider. Uh, and a little bit more about me. Uh, I spent 10 plus years working in different communities uh, in dev relations. I've been parts of communities since all the way back to BBS days of the 80s. Um, that kind of dates me a little bit, but back when, you know, Nine, uh, 600 baud modems, 2400 baud modems and such accessing uh, the internet or at the time, you know, bulletin boards. Uh, I've been also been community and dev relations consultant and uh, people often ask me, can you do any tricks? I can't, sadly. Uh, however, we might have some time at the end. If any of you want to do tricks, I'll be happy to video them and share them. So. So community, uh, I think it's like a watermelon. And to kind of give you an idea that probably sounds really uh, humorous, which I hope it will be. Uh, the story goes, uh, um, I have a wife, three kids, and when we, my wife was pregnant with our third, so this was uh, just about 11 years ago, almost 11 years ago around this time, um, she had, uh, she had to go in the hospital, she had um, kidney stones, and when you're pregnant you can't do anything about them, and, uh, complete pain, all, all this, and she spent a couple days in the hospital, get home, I'm really frustrated with the fact that we can't do anything, my wife's in pain, we have two younger kids as well, it, just really frustrated, and so I figured, okay, I'm the man, I'm going to go take out my frustration, uh, I look for things to do, I look in the backyard, and we have what looks to be a jungle growing up in our backyard, and I live in Kansas, which is not a jungle, so that needed to be dealt with, and so as I went out, I started, you know, I get the tools, and I'm just hacking away at this, the, the weeds, and I'm pulling stuff out, and I'm getting really frustrated, but getting things done, and feeling really good, and then I noticed that there's... Um, this watermelon just sitting there in the middle of these weeds, which I've later found out were not leaves, but actually the watermelon plant. And I can't figure out why. Why, why is there element, watermelon? So I'm, I'm digging in and I look, and then there's two more watermelons. We had three watermelons in this section of our yard. So I pull one off, take it inside, show it to my wife, and of course, her first thought, I love her dearly, but her first thought was, he just left me with the kids and went to the store and got a watermelon. Then her second thought, again, I love her dearly, was he just went and stole a watermelon from a neighbor and brought it home, which wasn't the case, obviously. So as I explained to her and showed her, and she was amazed. We went outside, we looked, and, and I showed her that we had a total of three watermelon. And we both started trying to figure out, how did this watermelon grow? How, how do we have these here? Because we didn't purposely do it. Uh, we didn't spend the time to you know, make sure that they were growing. And we remembered that probably four to six months earlier, we'd had some uh, of my family over, and I had younger sisters, and uh, we were having a watermelon seed spitting contest and with my kids and with my, my sisters. And uh, that's where they were spitting the seeds into. We had not done anything to, or no intention of actually growing watermelons and hadn't even thought about the fact that we had watermelon seeds that were all littering this area. And of course, I, I actually ended up killing it because I thought I was getting rid of weeds and so we haven't had any watermelons since. But we realized, and, and as I look back, communities are very much like that watermelon patch for us, is that sometimes they just pop up, you don't know where, you don't know why, uh, you often don't know what they're going to look like when you throw seeds out there. Um, it may be three of them. It may be an entire watermelon patch. You don't know. And that's, for me, the, the glory and the, the um, um, mystery and the, the excitement of communities. So what is community? A community is a group of people that have unique uh, values, uh, personalities, expertise, uh, interests, and then, uh, in many cases, humor. Um, if you all think about different communities that you've been a part of, as you've, uh, you know, maybe in your 
uh, open source days or maybe in uh, um, you know online days uh, you know wherever you're at Reddit you know you have Reddit you have Stack Overflow there's forums I've been a part of um, in the past XDA developers which is a big mobile developer forum uh, was there for a long time uh, running their DevRel and, and uh, community efforts. Um, but everybody has been a part of a community in some form, and I think you could probably identify, you know, looking at these, some of those communities you've been a part of. And if you ever want to go into be a community manager, um, there's a certain skill, and I, I'd say it's probably the, uh, one of the most important skills, it's cat herding. Cats are hard to herd, you know, as this, this GIF here shows. Uh, they don't do what you want them to do. You can't get them to line up. You can't get them to sit. You can't do, do anything. And often it is in communities just this idea of trying to get everybody going in the right direction and, and, and corralling them around. And so I, I say that you know, cat herding is an important skill. Uh, the need for communities is growing within uh, uh, within business. Uh, we're seeing that, um, you know, in di with apps. You know, um, Job talked about that with GitLab and, and how communities. Um, great talk that he had. Um, you know, we're seeing that need for communities grow um, because collaboration. Whether you're building a simple mobile app or a large scale website or, or something for a large corporation, uh, there is a constant need for ongoing support, regular updates, continuous improvement, and all of those things that is collaboration. It's all about, um, you know, collaboration is, is that priority and, and necessity for you as you're building your app or building uh, you know, website or whatever it might be. Um, and this takes on different forms and functions within whatever community you're in. Um, you know, it might, it's going to look differently if you're doing a, you know, just a developer to developer uh, type of collaboration or business to consumer or business to business or ABC or XYZ. And in different forms in, in themselves in like social, um, you know, Facebook, uh, you have forums. Um, it's going to look a little bit differently, but collaboration is, is definitely a necessity. Uh, traditional marketing is becoming less effective for community and uh, for developers. Um, how many of you that are out there, uh, by a show of hands, enjoy getting marketing messages for companies about how you should use their product? Nobody. Right. Um, nowadays, I mean, marketing used to work uh, when we weren't so saturated with it, but nowadays it's become, um, you know, just, especially with developers, it's less effective, um, and often they prefer, and developers prefer to um, instead receive unbiased recommendations from other developers, uh, friends, um, instead of, you know, this big marketing message, the emails that continuously go out. And they all have their place, but as a developer, often you just, you know, I know myself, I often just delete those things. Um, unless it has a catchy title and I might open up and realize that maybe I do want to know, but it's, it's not very often. Um, so in other words, if someone um, loves a particular product, they're more likely to share that with their, other, with their friends, and those friends will take that recommendation and be more willing to try out the product, the app, whatever it is you're building. Uh, and we've seen uh, plenty of case studies have been done around about the return on investment that companies get from their community outreach. Um, and we're seeing that with a lot of big companies now, uh, companies like American Express, Roku, um, SendGrid with email, um, Walmart and Starbucks and um, Subways and others are all understanding this idea that you building a community around your product is extremely important. Um, Joe mentioned that, you know, uh, development is, is where, you know, community is happening. Um, so this idea and, they, and understanding that importance of building kind of brand advocates or building um, super users within your community uh, that can help um, uh, bring the knowledge about what you're doing and what you're building, whether you're a company or whether you're an independent developer, getting people around you that are um, enjoy the product you're doing and building them up and, and giving them the, the tools and resources to really be effective for you is important. And a lot of research has been done that shows that, you know, having super users or brand advocates for, for your product or your, your app um, and your community is, makes five times more valuable. 
um, that will spend two to three times more. Um, and this is really good for if you have a freemium model that you're doing with, free with your product or your app. Um, they will spend more if they have um, found out more about you from super users or brand advocates. Uh, and they're going to spend on average more, uh, both time in the app but and also you know, if you have, again, that freemium model. Um, and then you do tend to get a, a larger social reach around your product. Um, typically, the reach for, for more people via social uh, is roughly around 150 people per share on just a brand advocate, whereas trying to get influencers doesn't always actually make, make as much difference. Um, and then they tend to be more, you know, trusted than these influencers like celebrities. Um, I don't really personally trust a celebrity says, hey, go use Beats headphones or whatever it is. And that's not a knock on Beats, just came to my mind. Um, but it, it, I'm more likely, and, I, and it's been shown, people are more likely to want to use a product or want to be involved in a community when uh, they receive that information from people that they trust as opposed to people they see on television or radio or YouTube. Uh, so life cycles of communities, as they kind of come up and if you, as you figure out you're going to want to start one, um, there's a, a company called Fever B, which is a, uh, they're a community consulting company. Um, they've kind of put together this idea of kind of four different stages in a community's life cycle, um, with each of those stages kind of having their own unique uh, steps or tasks that it takes to get to the, each stage. Um, in that inception phase, you're, you're kind of doing things you're inviting people to get involved in your community, starting to get involved in using your app. Maybe they're already using your app, but you want them to um, collaborate together. You're doing some inviting, starting discussions, whether it be in, on social or whether it's in a forum. Um, and you're trying to get participation from them uh, and then building the relationships needed to kind of keep that, make that community um, viable and, and go on to that next step, which is kind of get it established. Um, and in that kind of area, you're, you're, you're writing content um, or you're having somebody write content um, that can be social, that can be blog posts, it can be uh, you know, a medium post where you're talking about how you built your product. Um, organizing events or going to events and talks and, and sharing the vision of what you're building and, and that excitement. Um, those are all the things that kind of happen as you're in that establishment phase of a community. Uh, and then maturity is as you start, you really now have people that are following you, you're getting involved, uh, they uh, have stuck around and they're also sharing the, new, uh, the information. Uh, you have volunteers that say, hey, I want to help out with manning social for you, or I want to help out, um, you know, doing an event or going and talking about what you're doing, or those all things are happening in maturity where it's no longer just you and maybe your small team, it's people within the community are starting to do that exact same thing. Uh, mitosis, and, and that's kind of the science, science -y kind of thing, uh, where a cell kind of splits from one into, into a new nuclei, um, and in, you know, in, in this case, you know, forms more um, focused subgroups within your community that maybe are focused more on um, support, or maybe they're focused more on um, testing, uh, or even just development. Different subgroups kind of start to happen within that. Um, and you can kind of think of communities like an organism. They have that kind of same life cycle. Um, and you know, they're born, so that's the inception. Uh, they grow, establish, they, they mature, obviously maturity. And then some split, replicate themselves elsewhere, whether it's in your community or maybe a, it's forked and goes to somewhere else, but it's, it's still replicating itself. Um, but there's an often, there, there's another aspect of communities that I, I don't think it's talked enough about. Um, but it is sometimes where they die. Um, death. That escalated quickly. Um, that was supposed to get a laugh and it really didn't, so I'll not use that again. Um, but th those four cycles of community, uh, death is very much a part of community. Sometimes a community will just die. Um, and if that's the case, it's a sad moment for communities, but it's also an opportunity for something new to grow and something new to, to become because those resources now kind of get channeled into newer things that they can, to can grow and, and continue. So it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it is something that does happen. 
so I added into the life cycles. Um, so as I mentioned, kind of that community life cycle Fever B had put together, they've highlighted a few things uh, that this great graph. Um, in my slides, I'll have a link to the slides. You'll be able to see this graph. But um, it just gives you an idea of some of the key tasks that you tend to do. What does it typically kind of look like within a lot of different communities as you move between a lot of these um, uh, different life cycles? So. How to get people involved? Um, Susanna Fox, who's with the Pew Internet American Life Project, uh, a few years back said that if you can enable an environment which people can share, they will. And the benefits will entice others to join. So you may ask, how do I get started? How do I get started with building a community, getting people involved? Uh, first thing is you do need to identify your target devs. You need to identify where they hang out, what do they enjoy. Uh, you can do that in things like Stack Overflow, um, Stack Exchange, Hacker News, Reddit, um, other forums, social. Um, you can even do a form of online stalking to some extent without sounding really stalkish. Um, but it, you know, as your developers, you know who's using you know your product. You're using your app, um, and often just a simple you know search for them on Twitter. See what the things that they're excited about. Find them. You know, maybe f you find a Facebook or you find Reddit that they're involved in, and you see the things that they like. Um, that helps you kind of identify what are uh, what are the things that they're involved in, and, and maybe some things that you can work with uh, to kind of target towards those devs and other devs like them. Uh, so that helps you identify their interests and the motivations that they have. Uh, that as you're building your community, you can help to you know identify how to get them to participate more, how to reward them for participation. We'll touch on that as, as well. Uh, and you also want to remove barriers to adoption. And this is big within Dev DevRel. Uh, it's also big in communities. Is this idea that uh, you want to remove everything possible that keeps somebody from either trying your product or getting involved in your community. Uh, that is extremely important. And if, if especially developers, um, I've been one in, in past lives, and if you can't quickly get to uh, understand through either the documentation uh, or the, the sample or whatever it is that, to start using your product or using your app, if you can't get to that quickly, people are going to move on. Developers are going to move on. And so removing that barrier to get involved in your community or getting involved in your application is extremely important. So as you've got them, you know, you, you started to identify this community you want to build, um, it's important to onboard them correctly. Um, just as you would kind of make sure that you onboard people into a company correctly, this community is the same way. So there's some key pieces here. Uh, you want to make them feel welcomed and comfortable. Um, you want, you know, that they, they know that, okay, this is something good. It's not, you don't inundate them with, with a ton, ton of things. You're giving them specific, simple steps that they can get started. Uh, maybe it's a welcome email uh, that, you know, or, or a private message or something within your community, whether it's a forum or whatever, that just lays out the, the quick and easy ways that they can get involved. Maybe it's an introduction thread. Maybe it's a, a quick, um, they start doing something. And, they, and you've given them uh, a sticker, which, by the way, I have stickers if you want stickers afterwards. Um, you don't want to overwhelm them, though, with too much things to do right off the bat. You want that to kind of get them, give them some specific things and then let them go through that and then touch base with them at certain points. Uh, and over, over time, you're going to interact with them in multiple ways. It's not just email. It, it, it can be social. It can be, you know, like I said, private messages. And you want to convey kind of the culture and voice and the, the strategy of what you're trying to achieve within your community uh, throughout these things that you're doing. Uh, I mentioned earlier about you know looking at see what their motivations are, understanding some of the th reasons why people get involved in communities. Um, some people do it because they really want to help people, and they know and understand this pain forward idea is that they want to help because they know that at some point they might have a need themselves, and they might want uh, they want to know that they can go to the community as well. So some people participate uh, because of that. Others do it because they want to, you know, get recognition. Uh, they want to increase the, the uh, their viability within the community. Uh, you know, that is that is a, um, a a motivation. 
some people just want to make an impact. They, they don't do it because they want help or they don't do it because they want recognition. They want to selflessly help other people. Um, you really want those people as well. I mean, you're going to want all of these, but that's, those, are, those are the ones that can really be uh, important for you and your community. You also, uh, some people are going to do it because they want to connect with others that are in the community. Uh, they might, you know, that idea of, of connection and, and with others around the world, uh, that's, that can drive motivation and, and um, involvement within the community. Uh, and then some just that sense of belonging. They, they you know, in today's day and age, um, you know, sometimes that's as simple as it. They just want to have something to belong in. Um, Increasing participation, though, is, is something that you definitely want to pay attention to. Uh, and that's where all of this kind of comes together, is you understand who the people are and what their motivations are. That's how you can then get to that step of increasing participation. Um, some people do it, you know, and, and you can play off of their thing, but with recognition by, uh, you know, giving them a status boost in the community. So on, on forums, as you move through, you can become now, a, you know, instead of a regular member, now you're a senior member, and then maybe you can become a, um, you know, a, a, a moderator, or you can become, an, you know, maybe even an admin in the future. That status and recognition that you can get through um, through a community, that's, that's something you can do to increase participation, just kind of reward them that way. Um, access to more tools, information, resources are, are the ways. Uh, maybe, you know, as you're within your product, maybe your app you're building, uh, or within your company, um, identifying those that have really been participating more and you give them the opportunity that if you reach a certain level, you're now can be part of a beta program. You know, that's one way to kind of reward somebody, increase their participation because they get more access to, you know, tools or maybe they get access to your development team. Uh, some of those, those things, you figure out what works within your organization or within, you know, the app you're building. Find those things that give them those, you know, that can increase participation. Uh, more capabilities and control. Again, we talked about, you know, as you grow through, they might be able to, um, you know, get a free, uh, a free account for you know your your freemium model. They get an extra upgrade, or they um, you know get more capabilities in the community. Like I said, an admin or a moderator. That's that's another way that can kind of increase the participation. They know that they can achieve that. Uh, and some people just do it because they want swag. They want cool stuff, um, which is why I have swag because I want to increase participation. So. Uh, Auth0. So uh, our story, um, yeah, okay. So um, we start, we're an identity management company. Uh, we started uh, just, uh, we're on our sixth year now. And um, we grew out of a, um, just a desire to, you know, I'd figure out identity and, and make it easy for people to um, close that loop and become secure in their apps and their, you know, do authentication and authorization and user profiles. And when you start up a, a company, you have, you know, everybody's participating, everybody's supporting, you know, you're just driving to, to get people using your product. And uh, eventually when you start getting those paid customers that uh, now are paying you for the thing you're building, um, they are now require SLAs. They require, you know, knowing that if there's a problem, they're going to get somebody either through, you know, your support portal or, you know, if you have phone support, if you're in a company like that, uh, that's, a, that's something you've got to move to as you mature through a company. And so we reached a point where we recognized that we needed, uh, we couldn't have our, our, our free support happening in the same place as our uh, paid support. So we separated that out. We, we said, okay, we're going to, you know, put it, the community is going to be their free support and our paid support is going to happen through, you know, what we call support center. It's basically a front end for Zendesk. And, you know, with documentation and blogs and, and all those different things. And, but yet, and we had some people that were doing that within support. They would go through cycles where they would kind of help people in the community. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of dedication to it. They didn't have a team around it. And there really wasn't a strategy. They just kind of threw a platform at it. Um, they uh, didn't, 
which, which is not a great way to do it ultimately uh, because you're just kind of redirecting a problem uh, when you throw a platform at something and, and don't really devote a strategy and devote a team to, to doing that. Um, and we went with a product which I do not recommend. Um, see me afterwards, I'll, I'll tell you what not to use. I'll tell you what to, to use as well, um, in my opinion. But um, it was a Stack Overflow clone, um, which uh, in many ways it was like the company that did it looked like they had, uh, you know, kind of uh, said, okay, engineers, we want to we build this product once we like Stack Overflow. All those that are on UI and UX teams, go take vacation. And um, it just wasn't, we, it wasn't working for the community. People were, were asking questions and nobody was there because there was no uh, direction. We didn't really have a, um, a good idea of what it meant to, to you know, have gamification and all that. It was very much a support driven community. Um, and uh, there's nothing necessarily wrong with support driven communities. Um, I tend to kind of view them as um, kind of a, a, a vending machine community where uh, you pop in and you, you know, the developer goes up and says, I want some, some Duplo, goes to the machine, hits the button, gets it, walks away. Uh, and then the next guy comes up and nobody's there to help him make a decision of what he wants and he just pushes in a button and gets, gets it and goes. Um, and Jeff Atwood, who's the Stack Overflow creator, um, I have a portion of the quote, but I'm going to read the entire thing. He said that real community is so much more than just basic customer support. It's listening to your customers, talking to them in public, folding in the feedback you get from them, talking to your own team in public, watching customers give pro tips to other customers, developers helping developers, uh, and generally just walking alongside your customers and their journey with your product. And so what we're doing is we're, we're changing this idea of a support-driven community within you know, Auth0, and we're saying we want to, part of our strategy is developers helping developers. Uh, we've changed to you know, a new platform, uh, which is a lot more community and, and developer-driven. Uh, it's discourse, which I personally recommend. If you have questions, we can talk about that afterwards or in Q&A. Um, some of the things that we're doing to help build uh, this sense of community and, and uh, um, take some of these steps that I've talked about to, to change into more developers helping developers. The idea with developers helping developers is uh, that same kind of vending machine idea, but when somebody comes there and says, hey, how do I implement ABC? How do I implement uh, you know, Auth0 into a uh, single page uh, app? How do I do that? How does it work? Uh, we have engineers within our company that are doing this and in helping, um, but in, in my team that's doing it, um, but you want developers that are in your community that are also answering questions. Um, and so one of the steps that we're taking is building a leaderboard that kind of says who's who's the highest performer, letting it be seen publicly, that people know, uh, gaining recognition, that kind of comes to that in status, kind of plays into that participation piece so that people know who's the most um, involved. We have different rewards for that. Um, incentivizing participation, uh, there's a number of ways you can do that. Um, again, comes back to what really motivates people to get involved. Um, one of those, obviously, swag. Um, I don't recommend, like, there is, there's this idea of um, intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. Um, intrinsic are the things that are internal, and that's kind of like your status boost, or that's the helping because you want to feel uh, that you belong, or you, that you uh, can help others, and, and those are kind of intrinsic rewards that make you feel good. And leaderboards are good ways of doing that. Um, Throwing money at a problem, like like saying, you know, whoever performs, you know, this uh, this month that has answered the most questions or has solved the most things or has shared the most content gets, let's say, a hundred dollars. Um, that's great, but that can only last so long when you start throwing money at something like that, uh, and eventually that's going to go away. And if you get people, you you keep people in your community the way that you get them. And if you 
are essentially paying them to be a part, when you can't do that anymore, they will go away. So incentivizing and participation for us has been very much around, uh, you know, if you share some things, we'll send you a t-shirt. Uh, if you share some of the projects we're working on, uh, but we're also driving towards better status boost, um, again, the leaderboard idea, incentivizing that participation. Internally, we've done some incentives, and that's where um, it's okay from an internal perspective to push that kind of extrinsic reward. And so we have a, a reward that, you know, the person, the engineer, and it's anybody in the company, it's not just engineers, anyone that participates. Uh, and is the highest participating you know, team member within the company, uh, they get a $200 Amazon gift card each month. Um, and that drives more people to get involved. Um, and when you do that internally, you can also, as your community grows and you don't need to show as much from an internal side, you still want the involvement, you can dial that back um, and your community doesn't really suffer as much. Uh, but if you do it the other way and are paying your community, that's where you see a lot of um, attrition if you can no longer pay. Um, and then we're also doing, you know, a, a, we're going to be putting out our first developer community survey. Um, again, I came on, and I didn't, actually didn't mention this, but I came on uh, in f December. And so I've just been there six months as we have, you know, been... Um, you know, kind of redoing our community and, and kind of uh, changing direction or having a direction now and a strategy. Uh, and so getting that under, understanding who's in your community, uh, persona building is another, another term for it, uh, it's a marketing term, but it works, uh, is really understanding who's in your community. That way we can start to understand, you know, what are those areas and ways that we want to incentivize people um, and why do they participate and you know maybe where they're at so we can go start doing some meetups uh, and, and getting into the community because you need to have both online and offline as part of your community strategy. Uh, and then a, a super user program. It's something that you know I talked a little bit about earlier. We're in the process of putting that together of what that looks like, kind of like an experts type of program. Uh, we have an ambassador program, which is our um, kind of works a lot with our DevRel team uh, to go and, and speak, and we're helping them learn how to speak, and, and they're spreading the news uh, to people that are part of the community, but they they really want to learn how to be a, a speaker, and so we're you know helping facilitate that. Um, but we're going to take that a, a next step up and those that show that they are, you know, they have the technical, they're a bit more technical minded, they have a lot more of experience within, you know, our product and they have more experience within uh, the space that we, you know, are, are going with. Um, and, and so that's, that's extremely important. So we're going to be building that and I highly encourage you guys to do that. Uh, some of the resources here. Um, there's an open source project that's came out last year. It's called Chaos. It's a great term. Um, community health analytics open source software uh, helps you kind of build some of the analytics that you need to know about how a community works. Um, Art of Community by Jonah Bacon is a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, you can get the PDF online free. Uh, go to artofcommunityonline.org. On, art um, community Pulse po podcast uh, is kind of a DevRel and community uh, that's um, that's out there. That's really good. Uh, and then there's a, a DevWell DevRel weekly newsletter. Let's say that ten times fast. Um, that uh, you can sign up for, and it, that's really good as well. Gives some some good tips and some good ideas. Uh, so, with that, any questions? We got a couple minutes for questions. And if we don't have time, we can, you can definitely come and see me afterwards as well. see you, I don't hear you. <laughs> I think you're good now. Okay. Hey, okay. there you are. All right. So um, in your past experience, did you ever had, um, let's call it poisonous users, kind of those trolls and uh, actively advocating against your product and just, well, bad mouthing and so on? And how yes. did you deal with that? So um, I had mentioned I worked with XDA developers for years, um, online forum of over six million, well, at the time, at, now it's over eight million members worldwide. 
Uh, been around for 15 plus years. Um, I've seen my fair share of trolls and poisonous users. Um, some of them just need to go and you have to take steps and you have a code of conduct. I didn't mention that, but when you're building a community, it's important to have a code of conduct that you can fall back on to say, you, this, you're not following this, here's our action and here's how we're gonna take it. And it's very public of, of how you're gonna do it. Um, often I've found some of those troubled users, uh, if you reach out to them, and, and initiate a dialogue. Um, sometimes you can do it publicly, it depends on the, the situation. But getting to know them, I found that often those that tend to be trouble users, they're just passionate about the community. And some people don't do well with um, people that have a lot of passion. And so when they, they're, they're, they think this is the way it should be, um, maybe it's not the way it should be, but that's how they feel. Initiating contact with them helps you understand, uh, again, who they are, what, what are their passion, and if they're, you find out they're really passionate about your community, I've seen opportunities and, and seen examples of turning them into actually that passion, shaping that to be an actual really good thing for the community and for your product uh, by just having those conversations. But sometimes they just need to go, and they do. I really like and so it. here's. <laughs> Thank you. Right. See the swag and increasing participation. You get one of these if you ask. You get stickers already, but any more questions? Yeah. Otherwise, yep. I'll... Uh, so okay. talking about <laughs> you're, you're you're envious because he got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you want? Okay, <laughs> got it. Uh, so talking about communities. Um, how about doing it at a smaller scale? So, so imagine you have an open source project uh, hosted on GitHub, maybe as a side project for your uh, normal regular work. Um, so how would you kickstart building a community there? I can imagine that a lot of concepts are just overkill mm -hmm. uh, for such projects, but how, yeah, how do you attract people to actually engage with your project? So, do you have some Yeah, so, uh, so open source projects are, are definitely very interesting um, here while I'm, ah, close. Um, getting people to get involved in an open source project, especially if it's not well known, uh, can be a challenge. And some of that is um, if you know, chances are if you're getting involved in open source or you're, you have an idea for a project, you know people that might be interested in getting involved. And so sharing your idea with them, it, it, social is a great way of doing that. Uh, also getting on, you know, on GitHub and, and getting involved, uh, finding other prod projects that are similar that you can, you can talk to and share your ideas with, uh, that works really well. If you're a writer, uh, doing stuff on Medium, sharing, sharing that stuff out, that's, that's a great way of doing it. Um, depending on, you know, I, I've seen with a lot of open source projects, if you, um, there's often a niche, a niche of, of um, a target audience that you have of people that you want to use. And so going and finding, going on Hacker News is a great way to, you know, kind of share out, hey, here's what I'm working on, um, Reddit, those types of things to get feedback. Is a is a good way to kind of kickstart a lot of those conversations. That answer the question. Okay. Do we have time for one more? Um. Yes, we do. Okay. And you can also come up and ask me questions, and I'll have these stickers. Any last question? Um, maybe I would ask a question. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'm organizer at the local women tech makers yes. Berlin and um, Android Berlin uh, community. And um, what are your advices on um, managing tasks like scheduling which organizers should take care after social media or maybe um, do you do it like um, like one person all the time, or do you change? Um, I think that that's dependent on your community. Um, usually, there are um, when you when you start to build communities, you uh, and you have tasks. Be very open with, hey, here's the things we here's our needs. People like um, oftentimes people don't want to volunteer if they don't know that there's something to do. So mentioning, hey, we have. You know, somebody in my community would be great if you could do the social for us, or somebody that could write content. Listing that out, um, some people do that in either their 
full-time job and they want to do it and help and use their skills to help out. Others are interested in doing that. Maybe they want to get the experience. So offering it out to them as an option is, is, extreme, is a great way to do that. Okay. So all right, so thank you. Oh, my screen just went. I had one last slide. Yes, please do. Come on. Uh, okay. Um, you can go. Here's ways to find me. Um, I put together a repo that has all of these slides. Uh, and then there's a PDF. You can actually get directly to the slides there as well. Um, it's just bit.ly at or slash DC Berlin 18 repo and DC Berlin 18 slides. Um, come up afterwards. I'll, I'll pop over here. I have you know some swag stickers, Auth0 stickers. Um, and we are hiring. We hire. We're t totally remote company as well. So um, thank you very much. Thank you for this awesome talk.